diastolic dysfunction is very important in echocardiography and shouldn't be underestimated. But measuring diastolic dysfunction or grading filling pressures accurately is not always that easy. Especially when we talk about clinical phenotypes of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we need to understand diastolic dysfunction. First of all, and that will be discussed at the end of this lecture, tinkling sugar can be pretty cool. Why this is specifically cool in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, as said, we will discuss at the end of this video when we talk about the possible treatments. First of all, before we talk about the half path, we have to understand what diastolic dysfunction actually is. Well, it is a combination of inadequate filling of the left ventricle with a pathological relaxation and a reduction in LA function. And therefore, all this combined together leads to elevated filling pressures of the left ventricle. This is needed to still provide for an adequate stroke volume. So why measure diastolic dysfunction? Well, diastolic dysfunction is important when we talk about heart failure, not heart, only heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but also heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or mildly reduced ejection fraction. People can have dyspnea, they can suffer from edema. Diastolic dysfunction gives us prognostic information and people who have a diastolic dysfunction with elevated filling pressures can have a reduced exercise capacity. And the old folks with the stiff hearts, they will need treatment. The causes for diastolic dysfunction overall are various. People who have diabetes, who are overweight, people who suffer from very often long-standing hypertension and remodeling of the heart. Aging, of course, is a factor which can contribute to diastolic dysfunction. As mentioned previously, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction also always have some degree of diastolic dysfunction. Patients who have a dilated cardiomyopathy, a restriction, so restrictive cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, coronary artery disease, also valvular pathologies can cause diastolic dysfunction. And patients who have a left bundle branch block or have ventricular pacing to also have a degree of diastolic dysfunction. So it's quite easy to say why measure. Well, we need it for monitoring, monitoring of the filling pressures and correlated with the clinical status of our patients. We need it for prognosis and very often the measurements and echocardiography can give us hints towards the cause why filling pressures are actually elevated. The definition of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is as follows. So the hearts will be small and stiff, like when you think about hypertensive heart disease. The overall, even though the ejection fraction is preserved, there will be some degree of systolic dysfunction. You can measure it, for example, also in longitudinal strain, or global strain imaging. There will be an atrial dysfunction and this leads to elevated filling pressures. Here we have a summary of the current guidelines and the diagnostic criteria for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, also for the treatment strategies. And there we already talked the first time about why tinkling sugar is actually pretty cool. Well, let's have a look first at the last mentioned study over here. So the diagnostic algorithm, where we see that the echocardiographic diagnosis of diastolic dysfunction not about half in a patient with left ventricular ejection fraction of or above 50%, you have to have over the half of the following criteria positive. The reduced E prime velocity, the E to E ratio, or the E to E prime ratio, the left atrial enlargement by left atrial volumetric index and the elevated estimated systolic pulmonary arterial pressure, which you can measure with the TR signal. If you want to know more about this diagnostic algorithm and about diastolic dysfunction overall, you can click the top at the box and watch over an hour of diastolic dysfunction by means of the newest guidelines. A score, we can also use the so-called HFA PEF score. It was from 2019, published in 2019. And there it says that half PEF diagnosis can be made in a symptomatic patient. So there are two steps. The first step is that the patient has to be symptomatic and the left ventricular ejection fraction has to be preserved. Then five to six points in this score for the different domains, so the minor criteria and major criteria, make the half path 
diagnosis likely. What we need to measure are again echo measurements. We need the reduction of uh, E-prime velocity. We need the increased E to E-prime ratio. We need the elevated estimated systolic pulmonary arterial pressures, of course, measured by TR again. And this includes also the global longitudinal strain value, so the normal left ventricular ejection fraction, but a reduced global longitudinal strain. You can measure it with speckle tracking. Also, there are plenty of videos created about speckle tracking and global longitudinal strain. Also, you can click the box again and watch a video about this. So strain imaging is truly fascinating. I'm a huge fan of it. So if you want to know more, I just have to encourage you to try if you have the software and use strain imaging. But to continue with the HFA PEF score, we also need morphological criteria. So the concentric, I wouldn't call it LVH per se, but concentric remodeling as we see it in hypertensive heart disease and the left atrial enlargement by means of the left atrial volumetric index. And this also includes the biochemical component, the elevated natriuretic peptides, and it differs also for patients in sinus rhythm and in atrial fibrillation. Then, of course, we have the ESC 2021 guidelines, and those guidelines tell us that we have, again, the left ventricular ejection fraction above for 50% plus the symptoms and signs, and the Objective evidence of a cardiac structural or functional abnormality is consistent with the presence of diastolic dysfunction and raised left ventricular filling pressure. So it's again about the echocardiographic measurements and the LV filling pressures. We also include the natriuretic peptides, the concentric, I will call it not necessarily LVH, but concentric remodeling also can be concentric LVH. But we also need the left atrial enlargement, the increased E to E prime ratio, and of course, again, the SPAP measurement. As a treatment, we have diuretics for symptom control. This is a class one recommendation. Of course, diuretics help to reduce the symptoms, but it truly does not help for prognosis. We do know that. The treatment of the etiologies and cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular diseases has to be thought of and has to be done. This is also a class one recommendation. So you have to treat coronary artery disease, you have to treat diabetes, you have to treat the, the LDL. So we have a lot of different strategies we have to use, but there is no or not yet a therapy for the HEFPEF listed. In the American Heart Association guidelines from 2022, we have an update of this, I would say. We have, again, the left ventricular ejection fraction above for 50%, plus the symptoms and the signs and the evidence of a spontaneous or provocable increased left ventricular filling pressure. So if it is not in a resting situation, we are not talking also about stress echocardiography or stress testing for diastolic dysfunction. This is also mentioned in the uh, different scores and is it also mentioned in the diagnostic algorithms. If you have still a patient who has dyspnea with exercise, you can do diastolic stress testing. And, of course, we need the elevated natriuretic peptides and non-invasive or invasive hemodynamic measurements are included here as well. The half of treatment now is quite interesting because the diuretics, of course, for symptom control we need. This is a strong recommendation. Also, the guidelines state as a treatment for the half pef the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, is possible. It's a 2A recommendation with the SGLT2 inhibitors, the 2B recommendation is for ARNIs and mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. So we now have also a recommendation for specific treatment. Now, this has still nothing to do with the phenotyping of HEFPEF. Now, let's have a look at the different versions of phenotyping. There's a very nice paper. You have here the citation. I would encourage you to read it, but I want to summarize and focus in this lecture on the clinical phenotypes and the etiological phenotyping in patients with specific heart failure with preserved ejection fraction etiologies. So first of all, we talk about the clinical phenotypes because those are the patients you will very often encounter, patients with coronary artery disease, systemic hypertension, also non-cardiac comorbidities such as diabetes, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation. Those are all diseases which are, which are common. So you will encounter those patients. And it's very important to think 
about the possibility that they can have elevation of feeling pressures and therefore also a have to have a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And then move on with, for example, the HFA PEF score. The etiological phenotypes, on the other hand, they have a specific etiology, which we are possibly able to treat in case of amyloidosis. We have medication at hand. In case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we do have very soon a potential medication at hand. And also in case of Morbus Fabri, we can provide treatment, medical treatment for those patients. So the etiological phenotyping is also very important as well. And when you perform echocardiographies, think about those etiological phenotypes and push your patients into the right direction for the right treatment. Now the clinical phenotype one I want to discuss for me is the arterial hypertension, so hypertensive heart disease. Very often in this case, for example, you see a peristernal long axis view and the valves are truly thick. They are approximately 14 to 15 millimeters. So truly thick walls, interventricular septum and the inferolateral wall over here. You also see that the valves are a little bit calcified, degenerative valves overall. But what is very striking is that this was a, a fairly young patient. It was, she was 55 years old at the time we took the echocardiogram and she had this huge LVH. Of course, you have to think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and, and rule other diseases which can cause LVH out. But the only thing which was left overall was arterial hypertension. So she was admitted with a systolic blood pressure of 200 to 230 and she had it for several days and we lowered it very, very slowly because of course when she had a blood pressure of 160 170 uh, systolic measurement she already was feeling very dizzy and very bad because her body of course was used to the severe hypertension and of course it was untreated and very often you have a poorly controlled arterial hypertension so this clinical phenotype shows poorly controlled untreated long-standing hypertensive patients what happens? What is the sequel of this patient? Well, of course, the arteries, they are stiffening. Not only the heart becomes stiff, the ventricle becomes stiff, the atrium as well, but also the arteries. We have the remodeling, as mentioned, of the left ventricle. You can see it over here. That's now a apical four chamber view. You see it quite nicely. Also, left ventricular ejection fraction is borderline, so I would say it's around 50%, probably even mildly reduced. So we have to be very careful to call this heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But still, we can see that it's definitely not severely reduced. This hypertension, this hypertensive heart disease causes a multi-organ inflammation, of course, an increased afterload. And this patient had a severely reduced exercise capacity. So furthermore, we can delineates that the left atrium is dilated. Also, the free wall of the right ventricle is thickened. And of course, again, the left ventricular hypertrophy. In this case, it's really concentric hypertrophy because the inner diameter of the left ventricle is fairly normal, but the heart, the walls of the heart, they are thickened. What about diastolic dysfunction? In this case, we have the four chamber view with a pulsed wave Doppler signal. We see the E wave and the A wave, and this is a so-called restrictive filling pattern. This is diastolic dysfunction, grade three and elevated filling pressures are definitely evident. So what we have to do is, of course, we have to control hypertension. If hypertension is controlled, the reduction hospitalization is evident. So if you control hypertension, the hypertension of this patient, they do not have to be admitted that often to the hospital. You have also a reduction in the onset of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and treatment improves overall clinical status. So for this specific patient, we, as I said, we lowered the blood pressure very carefully so that she doesn't stop the medication and she still stays compliant. But over time, we could control her blood pressure and she was, of course, feeling overall way better. We also added strain imaging and what you can see in strain imaging, which is also quite evident, is that there is a global reduction of strain. We see a global strain of minus 10.6. We have here the 
four chamber view and the apical long axis view. And what we can also overall see is that there's an area which is blue. So this would be or uh, denotes the, uh, this kinetic area, which is not evident here. So it's a definite reduction in strain, but due to the severely thickened walls, this leads to, I would say, an overestimation of the reduction or the reduced function of the left ventricle, but still strain overall is definitely at least moderately reduced. Furthermore, I want to show you that there is still somewhat of a basal to apical gradient. So this is not a clear case of apical sparing, but of course, in hypertrophy, very often you have this gradient. Also in young health individuals, you have a certain gradient. So the, the basal segments, they, are, they don't have that high values. They are around minus 19. And in also young individuals, when you go to the apex, the values become more negative. So this partly apical sparing or this not severe apical sparing, we can see in amyloid heart disease, we also see in other forms of hypertrophy or hypertrophied ventricles. We continue with the measurement of the right ventricular free wall. We have to do this in the subcoastal image. This is a subcoastal four chamber view, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and this is a focused view on just the parts of the free wall of the right ventricle in a subcoastal view where you should measure the right ventricular free wall. We do see that we should measure in this area and the measurement above four millimeters. And in this case, if I recall correctly, it was six to seven millimeters. It's definitely enlarged. So what else can we do? We can use left atrial strain and we see that we have a relatively normal curve overall. Here it is not 100% optimal, but we see that the strain is definitely reduced. Here the first value, minus 23, that's the pulse, that's definitely reduced. Also the conduit strain with minus 13 and the contraction strain with minus 10, they're also reduced. I also want to mention that I put some links in the video description where you can see the normal values of left atrial strain imaging because it's sometimes very hard to remember all these numbers. So just click the link and check those graphics out. Continuing with right ventricular strain, you see here also several values. You can see here the overall region of interest here, the tracing, the strain M mode, and here the curves. And what we can visualize is that the global strain with minus 17.5 is reduced. Also the free wall strain with minus 20% is reduced. The normal value would be in the range of minus 23 and more negative values. Whereas the TAPSI, the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion with 19 millimeters is still normal. So we do see that the basal segment is contracting quite nicely, but the mid and overall the apical segment, they're reduced. So this leaves us with an overall reduction in free wall strain and in right ventricular strain imaging. Furthermore, we have to take a look at the IVC. The IVC is dilated. We have definitely a reduction in a little bit of collapsibility while inhaling is present. We also, when we scan the lungs, see some B lines. There's also pulmonary congestion present. And we do have a small plural diffusion. So this black space over here denotes free fluid in the plural space. We can evaluate the valves as well. We do see with color Doppler imaging that we have a probably here mild mitral regurgitation and a mild aortic regurgitation. Those are common findings in patients with hypertensive heart disease. Here we also do see the mild MR. So this small flare, this is the mitral valve, of course, this is the tricuspid valve, the aortic valve as well. Now we have a very important topic we need to discuss. How should we describe LVH? Because LVH is not always left ventricular hypertrophy. We have here this overview where we can see that we have the left ventricular mass index, which we need first index to body surface area, so gram per square meter, where we have the reference range for females. It's below 95 gram per square meter, so 43 to 95. And for males, it's 49 to 115 gram per square meter. And when it's below, we have a normal left ventricular mass index as seen over here. So in case of the relative wall thickness and the left ventricular mass index, we need formulas. 
Those formulas you can find in the internet, but I also have a dedicated lecture of left ventricular hypertrophy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for you in preparation. So when it's uploaded, you can also watch this video. But it's very important that you differentiate the relative wall thickness. So if it is below or 0.42, we have a overall a normal geometry of the left ventricle. For all those measurements and the calculations, we simply need the left ventricular and diastolic diameter. We need the size of the interventricular septum, so the thickness of the interventricular septum and the thickness of the infralateral wall. And when we have a relative wall thickness with a normal left ventricular mass, and the relative wall thickness exceeds 0.42. So in this case, we have a so-called concentric remodeling. So this is not concentric hypertrophy. Concentric hypertrophy is defined by an increased left ventricular mass index. So for males above 115 grams per square meters and for females above 95 grams per square meter. And here we can see that if the left ventricular cavity is large, we have eccentric hypertrophy. If it is small, we have concentric hypertrophy. So we can differentiate how the left ventricle or how the form of the left ventricle in case of thickened heart valves actually is. And I would stick to this description because it makes a difference in my personal point of view. If someone, for example, has remodeling in case of hypertensive heart disease, hypertrophy in case of, for example, in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or also that we should describe as increased thickness of the walls, amyloid heart disease, because amyloid heart disease is an infiltrative disease. So it's different by means of etiology compared to concentric remodeled left ventricle with hypertension or a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Continuing with the next clinical phenotype, we now talk about the clinical phenotype 2. So we leave arterial hypertension for a moment and we talk about coronary artery disease. Of course, hypertension is an important risk factor for coronary artery disease, but as a clinical phenotype here, the leading problem is the coronary artery disease. So we have, in this case, very often a microcirculatory problem or inoka, so ischemia with no obstructive coronary artery disease. And we have this microvascular dysfunction. So two thirds of clinical ischemia, so quite a lot of patients have this microvascular dysfunction. So not an obstruction in a relevant or in a large coronary artery, but of the microvasculature. So it's a very important disease entity we have to think about. This is such an example of strain imaging and ejection fraction. In this patient, we have an ejection fraction of 55%. So it's normal in the normal range and a definitely reduced global longitudinal strain with a basal reduction. So we see a basal reduction, also somewhat of a gradient. Also the ventricle, as we see here, is to a certain degree thickened, probably due to hypertension. In strain imaging, we see this bullseye display. We also have a reduction more in the basal segments. Here in the apical segments, we have somewhat of a spared area as well. And we have to note that the global strain, so the global longitudinal strain is minus 15.1%, so definitely in the reduced range of strain imaging. Let's move on to the clinical phenotype 3. This can be a little bit tricky because here I brought an example with atrial fibrillation with a case of heart failure with definitely reduced ejection fraction. So this ejection fraction is definitely not above 50%, but below 40%. It's, I would say, from the visual aspect in the range of 30%. But, and this is very important, I brought to this example because it so nicely shows what the problem of a patient with atrial fibrillation can be. Because atrial fibrillation can, per se, of course, cause dyspnea, but, and that's important, atrial fibrillation can lead to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because it's a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. And it overall leads to an elevation of left atrial pressures, which also can, on the other hand, cause atrial fibrillation. So it's a vicious circle. When you're once in this circle, it's very hard to get out and we have to help those patients. In this case, we do see a severely enlarged left and a severely enlarged right atrium also even we do not see the right ventricular wall here properly, we can assume that the right ventricle is dilated. And 
we do see also the left ventricle is to a certain degree dilated. The walls are not severely thickened, but still there is a certain degree of LVH present. And it's important to note that in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is fairly high. With a patient who also has atrial fibrillation, we do see the enlarged right and left atrium. We do see the calcified valves, even calcifications here at the beginning of the LVOT, so also the aortic valve. We see just a little bit of the aortic valve over here is calcified, but left ventricular function in this case seems preserved. It's in the range of 50% in this apical four chamber view. In the context of this clinical phenotype of atrial fibrillation, of course, we have to note that AFib and HFPF have common risk factors. Of course, the metabolic syndrome, hypertension, and we have the so-called chicken and egg problem. What was first the case? Was it atrial fibrillation or was it HFPF? So HFPF leading to AFib or atrial fibrillation leading to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Overall, the consequence is that we have an elevation of BNP, so the brain atriatic peptide. We have heart failure symptoms and, of course, left atrial dilatation. We are not done yet with atrial fibrillation because also atrial fibrillation can lead to severe secondary mitral regurgitation. So in case of a dilated left atrium, we can have a severe mitral regurgitation. This is a different example. So you have to differentiate in between secondary mitral regurgitation due to, for example, LA dilatation or left ventricular dilatation and differentiate it from severe primary MR. This is a patient where you see an example of a severe MR, but this is due to a primary cause. This patient had a prolapse and a partial flay leaflet. Why am I showing you this? Well, of course, the severe mitral regurgitation also can lead to left atrial dilatation and also can lead to atrial fibrillation, which then also you have to think about when you think about reconstruction of the mitral valve and operation of the mitral valve. So here we have atrial fibrillation a severe mitral regurgitation, which was the cause for left atrial dilatation and atrial fibrillation and the left ventricular hyperdynamic function. Overall, rhythm control and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with atrial fibrillation, we do not know if that actually helps or benefits our patients. Here I want to show you more examples of the case we have seen. So the patient with atrial fibrillation, hyperdynamic left ventricular function, and here the posterior mitral valve leaflet, probably in the region of P2 here. And this is a patient with thickened heart, also a thickened mitral valve, so by means uh, of a morbus barlow. And due to this prolapse and this probably partial flail, you see quite a bit here it's very, very subtle. You have severe mitral regurgitation. The next clinical phenotype you have to talk about is the phenotype of pulmonary hypertension. In pulmonary hypertension, we know that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction we know leads to endothelial dysfunction in the pulmonic vasculature. So we have a problem already very often in rest, but even more so during exercise. The pulmonary arteries, they're normally a low pressure system. So it's causing more oxidative stress. It leads to RV dilatation and overall to right ventricular dysfunction as well. That creates a secondary tricuspid regurgitation, which causes the right ventricle even more to fail. So again, we have this vicious circle where we have the dilatation of the right ventricle, the reduction in function, the coaptation defect of the tricuspid valve and TR and that leads to even a further deterioration of right ventricular function and a more severe dilatation. In the short axis, we also do see this prominent right ventricle, the prominent trabecular system, the prominent moderator band, the small but thick left ventricle, so the small cavity and the thick left ventricular walls, and this D shape of the left ventricle showing elevated pulmonary pressures as well. The next phenotype, it's the phenotype 5. This is about non-cardiac comorbidities. The non-cardiac comorbidities include simply obese patients, patients with diabetes. It's a growing group because 
more and more patients have diabetes, more and more people are obese. And 50% of half pef patients are obese and 50% of half pef patients do have diabetes mellitus type 2. And again, I want to emphasize this, of course, is a growing group. So we have to motivate our patients and probably also ourselves doing the stressful work all the technicians and medical professional have that we still have to stick to a certain exercise routine. So always keep this in mind that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction can have other non-cardiac comorbidities we have to treat by means of medication, but also by means of lifestyle changes. So this is very important to keep in mind. With this clinical phenotype 5 with the non-cardiac comorbidities, I want to discuss some more disease entities, for example, chronic kidney disease. We do know that chronic kidney disease, so when the kidneys are failing, they cause a volume problem, also they cause a problem of the left ventricle. So they can cause heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. On the other hand, when we have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and elevated filling pressures, that can cause on its own chronic kidney disease. Furthermore, we have to think about COPD patients. They can also develop a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction due to their chronic lung disease, patients with sleep apnea, patients with anemia as well. Here's an example of a, another case of diastolic dysfunction grade 3. So the elevated filling pressures are here quite obvious. We have a diseased left ventricle, a diseased left heart, and we have this restrictive filling pattern. We have this very high and steep E wave and a very small A wave. What can we do with this clinical phenotype 5? Well, of course, now we can treat heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and we also can treat the comorbidities. This is just an example of an obese patient we do see here is a lot of fatty tissue also in the pericardium but around the heart as well and we have a definite reduction in image quality. This is a huge problem with obese patients. In patients with a reduction in image quality, we always have to keep in mind we can use contrast imaging that to a certain degree prohibits us from using Doppler measurements. At least we have to be very careful with those. But with contrast agents, we see that left ventricular function or we can see how left ventricular function actually is. And we can also delineate the endocardial borders quite nicely so that we can differentiate the thickness of the myocardium and also the volume of the left ventricle. Continuing with the etiological phenotypes, I want to show you another example with relatively bad image quality. So we have here a four chamber view, a two chamber view, where we use the last or the one before the last to interpret and hear the apical long axis. So this is definitely reduced image quality, but still we could use strain imaging. This is the first case of, in this publication I primarily mentioned, the so-called secondary heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or a possible etiology for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So in this case, I also wouldn't be sure that ejection fraction is still normal. It seems to be definitely reduced from eyeballing. I would say we are in the range of 30, 35%. So it's more towards the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but overall we see that strain imaging still can help. In this case also contrast agent would have helped to delineate the endocardial borders quite nicely and would have helped to differentiate if ejection fraction is truly as reduced as we would think as we see it in the B-mode imaging. In this case, in this possible secondary half path, we have this typical cherry on top pattern. So we have this apical sparing where we do see the values are still red in the darker red color over here and especially at the basal segments we almost have no longitudinal function of the myocardium present anymore. So even in reduced image quality strain imaging is a relatively robust parameter. Here we have an example of a still borderline left ventricular ejection fraction, another case of amyloid heart disease with definitely a better image quality. We do see that the walls of the left ventricle, they are definitely thicken. They are not, as I mentioned previously, not necessarily hypertrophied. And also amyloidosis can be a cause 
a patient has heart failure symptoms, of course. So when they have still a normal ejection fraction, it is up to 15% of the half path cases of cases we call heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which actually have an underlying diagnosis of amyloidosis, which we could treat. So in this case, we have to use a certain clinical likelihood and exclude amyloid heart disease in our pertrophied ventricles or in uh, left ventricles which have a thickened myocardium, especially when we have also aortic stenosis, a certain age and other factors as well, which make amyloid heart disease more likely. But this also I will discuss in the video on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and left ventricular hypertrophy or thickened walls of the left ventricle. I want to emphasize again, so this thickening of the left ventricular walls in case of amyloid heart disease, it's not per se LVH. Also, other chambers have thickened walls, so the interatrial septum, for example, is thickened, the right ventricle is thickened, and here we have this example of the four-chamber view in a patient with ATTR, amyloid heart disease, amyloidosis, and the left ventricular tracing, where you can even adapt the region of interest to even include the thickened myocardium. Here's the example of the right ventricle. Here we see the free lateral wall. The right ventricular wall is thickened. There's a definite reduction in free wall strain and global strain as well. Here, take a look at the free wall strain. It's minus 18 only. So the normal value, as I said previously, is minus 23. Also, the top C is reduced, maybe not as reduced as it is written here, but still it's definitely reduced. We do see here the individual values of the segments and the free wall strain includes those three segments. This is the color M mode again. We still see that the right ventricular free wall has overall better values compared to the segments we included of the left ventricle. What else we can evaluate in amyloid heart disease? Well, we can see that the left atrium is also in this case severely enlarged and we have this restrictive filling pattern and elevated filling pressures. Not necessarily we always have a restrictive filling pattern, but we have a certain degree of hints that the filling pressures are elevated. And in this case, we have a reduction of the E prime. So this is the septal, the medial E prime. You see the pulse wave Doppler over here. This is the color coding of the tissue Doppler imaging. And we see it's definitely below five centimeters per second. And the normal range is around six. So it's definitely reduced and the E to E prime ratio in this patient was elevated as well. Another measurement we can perform, of course, is the left atrial strain. And in this case, we see a different curve. Of course, in atrial fibrillation, we cannot measure the contraction strain because it's simply not existing. So CT contraction strain is not measured, but we can measure the pulse or the peak atrial longitudinal strain. And that is only 5%, which makes elevated filling pressures also from a standpoint of left atrial strain very likely. This is another example of this patient. We do see this apical sparing. We have the four chamber view in the ATTR meliosis with the bosa display and this nice cherry on top. So this apical sparing and this patient received a therapy for his disease. So Tafamidis you can use as a therapy for ATTR amyloidosis. Another entity when we talk about so-called secondary half paths is the hypertrophic obstructive or non-obstructive cardiomyopathy. In this case, we also have a thickening of the ventricle. So a thickening of the myocardium, which is true left ventricular hypertrophy. And we can see it over here. This is uh, the interventricular septum. And this is the region where we have the thickest walls in this for chamber view, so the lateral wall is not that thick, at least what we can see. We can even delineate it better with contrast agent and we see that truly this is a septal hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But from these images, as we can see, there is no obstruction present. The lateral wall and here in the apex as well is definitely not severely hypertrophied, whereas the septum is truly thickened and hypertrophied. Here we can also use strain imaging to help differentiate how longitudinal function truly is. Systolic longitudinal function. It's overall the most common genetic heart disease. So in case of a thickened hypertrophied ventricle, you have to think about 
hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, even healthy individuals or before it was obvious or evaluated that they actually have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they were considered healthy, they can suffer from a sudden cardiac death. We have here no increased afterload, so we should not see a relevant aortic stenosis and we shouldn't have, of course, severe uncontrolled hypertension. And we have this true form of left ventricular hypertrophy. And here in this strain imaging, in this bullseye display, you see the inferior lateral and inferior and lateral regions are contracting quite nicely. When we look at the septal regions, the strain is reduced. So in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and in hypertrophy, the region where the heart or the left ventricle is hypertrophied the most will normally have the most severe reduction in strain imaging. We can see here this quite interesting phenomenon. Again, here the machine thinks that this due to this hypertrophy is even a dyskinetic motion of the heart, which in fact is simply this hypokinetic longitudinal function of the ventricle with this severe hypertrophy. Here we have a case with the MRI with left ventricular hypertrophy. You can see quite nicely that the lateral regions, they are not really hypertrophied, but the septal portions of the ventricle, they are truly severely hypertrophied. And these patients, they can suffer from dyspnea, but they can also have a syncope. They can suffer from VTEC and as I said, sudden cardiac death is a topic, especially also in young and before the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, healthy individuals. Think about in athletes about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because it's a common cause for sudden cardiac death in young athletes as well. What can we do? Well, so far we can give beta blockers or calcium antagonists, especially here, erapamil, for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy to reduce the gradient in the LVOT as we see it here. We also see it here quite nicely. This is a case of an hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. You see the thickening of the septum, the posterior and the anterior mitral valve leaflet. This is the aortic valve and during systole the anterior mitral valve leaflet is pulled towards the thickened interventricular septum. This is a so-called SAM phenomenon. So a systolic anterior movement or motion of the anterior mitral valve leaflet, which causes an LVOT obstruction or possible LVOT obstruction and also possibly mitral regurgitation. You can see it with contrast that truly the LVOT gets blocked by the anterior mitral valve leaflet, so this SAM phenomenon. The good news is that there is a so-called new kid on the block, Mavacamtin. It's a cardiac myosin inhibitor and it has very promising results and shows or treats patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with a reduction of actin myosin cross bridges. Due to that, the hypertrophy can be reduced and also the gradients can be reduced. So we do not necessarily need surgical treatment and overall, we have to mention that beta blockers and verapamil very often they are not well tolerated by patients who have hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So I'm very curious to find out more about Mavacantin and how it actually works. In Mavacantin, what we know so far is that it works quite nicely, but we have to evaluate ongoing left ventricular ejection fraction to not oversee that ejection fraction over time is reduced as a side effect. Here is the example again with strain imaging. We do see that this portion of the ventricle where it's severely hypertrophied, now we just measured this specific part, is the most reduced. We do see again somewhat of an apic gradient, but the lateral portions and the infralateral portions, they are still contracting normally. But the most thickened parts, the septal parts, so the basal and the mid segments of the left ventricle or the interventricular septum, they show the least longitudinal function, the least contraction. Here we can see the strain curves and we do see that this basal segment shows here quite nicely the most reduction and also practically no longitudinal function is present. But be aware here, the optimum measurement would have included the entire thickness of the septum. 
I want to show you this hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy also with a Cine loop in MRI. And we can very nicely see in this a little bit oblique for chamber view that there are several things we also already saw on DECO as well. We do see that the septum is the part which is mostly hypertrophied. We do see that there is this SAM, the systolic anterior motion, and we do have here a flow turbulence, even we see it on MR with in the LVOT, so this LVOT obstruction and this SAM phenomenon. And we also see here a flow through the mitral valve in systole, which is mitral regurgitation. So these patients, of course, need an MRI to quantify the risk and to see if they are more likely to have a possibility of sudden cardiac death. But it also shows very nicely how we can compare two imaging modalities. So echocardiography and MRI, especially in these Cine loops, you can compare the images and the findings quite nicely. But this will also be a topic when we discuss left ventricular hypertrophy and the thickened left ventricular walls. As another example of a hypertrophied left ventricle and a possibly secondary HFPF is a Morbus Anderson Fabry. In this case, I brought you the only case I have seen so far of a Morbus Fabry. We do see here a severely reduced left ventricular function. So this is a case of HFREF. So in this case, we do not have a HFPF. Very often we can still see a normal function also in Fabry patients, but this patient has a very I would say unique form of the disease. We do see the binary sign to a certain degree. So the layers of the myocardium, where we do see several layers inside the septum, but it's truly subtle, but it's a thickened septum. So we have a problem of the left ventricle by means of thickened myocardium, but we also have wall motion abnormalities in the apical regions and the lateral regions. And also here in the apical long axis view, we do see that there is a thin, a very thin myocardium, and that leads to this almost dyskinetic part of the ventricle. We can also see it here in the four chamber view. So this is a thickened myocardium, but a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The ejection fraction we graded in the range of 30% so 25 to 30, I would say. And we also, of course, included strain imaging. And in strain imaging, we do see that overall the global strain in this four chamber view is definitely reduced, but all the individual segments are reduced or show a reduced strain as well. Especially here, the lateral segment shows even some parts of a dyskinesia. We can see it here in this curve as well. Here we also would have some degree of post-systolic shortening. So, in this patient, when we add contrast, we can see that the myocardium is truly thin. So it looks like almost like a scar. So it's definitely below six millimeters. We do see some trabeculations. We see the hypertrophied septum. So it's very interesting, but a very atypical case of a Morbus Fabry. So Morbus Fabry is caused by an X-linked mutation in the GLA gene that leads to a deficiency of the alpha galactosidosis A and this causes a consequent accumulation of toxic metabolites. It's a lysosomal storage disorder. And we do have an oral pharmacological chaperone therapy or enzyme stabilizers to help those patients if they have a specific mutation. But we have to note that it is crucial to prevent the tissue damage. The patient should be treated before they develop organ failure because no treatment can reverse when actually the organ is damaged. So in, in this case, we do have the status quo that we have a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. This patient had a mutation and he is now receiving this enzyme replacement therapy. But of course, in this specific case, we have to think about also bringing this patient, if he further deteriorates, to heart transplantation. But continuing with findings of Morbus Fabry, we already discussed the strain. We do see the LVH or the thickened myocardium again. We have a restriction, a restrictive feeling pattern, diastolic dysfunction, and of course, a vascular defunction is a follow-up of the disease to the 
coronary artery disease those patients can develop. Interestingly, the scar we see over here was not the problem of a blocked vessel, so there was no significant coronary artery disease present in this specific patient. Patients with Movus Fabri can show to your department with heart failure, with arrhythmias, with angina, of course with chronotropic incompetence and even with sudden cardiac death. So these patients are at risk and they can have a specific therapy, a replacement therapy, but of course we have to do genetic testing. Here the bullseye display, which displays quite nicely the basal segments and the reduction in strain in the apical segments, especially in the lateral and inferior lateral region, where we also did see this possible scarring of the left heart. Also in MRI, we can see that there is the LVH. It's nicely shown over here in this Cine loop of the four chamber view. And we do see here is the scar tissue we also did visualize with echocardiography as well. Also in his case, the measurement of the diastolic dysfunction revealed a restrictive filling pattern. And that means that elevated filling pressures are evident. In his case, he has a reduction in left ventricular function and he has an E to A ratio far beyond two. Another possible cause of heart failure, secondary heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which I want to discuss with you because it is actually mentioned in this paper, is mitral stenosis. With mitral stenosis, we can see it quite nicely visualized over here. So this is a severely calcified valve. So this is a degenerative mitral stenosis. We also have calcifications all around the mitral valve, the LVOT, the papillary muscles, the caudal tendina even. And here we do see the definite reduction of the opening of the valve and the severely enlarged left atrium. Also, this patient had atrial fibrillation. And what we can nicely visualize with color Doppler is this color Doppler signal, which enters the left ventricle from the mitral valve. It looks like a candle flame. This is suggestive of mitral stenosis. And in this case, it was moderate to severe mitral stenosis. The problem with mitral stenosis and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is that the filling pressures very often do not play an important role, but we do see similar findings. We do see that left ventricular function, as in this case, is preserved. It's leading to a dilatation of the left atrium because, of course, we have a hindrance for blood flow, so we have an increased pressure of the left atrium, but not of the left ventricle because the left ventricle is even protected by this stenosis of the mitral valve. We have, of course, due to the hemodynamic sequelae, a dilatation of the right ventricle and a reduction in right ventricular function. We have a dilatation of the right ventricular annulus, the tricuspid valve annulus, and we have a dilatation of the right atrium and a evident pulmonary hypertension if we measure systolic pulmonary pressures as well. Still, we have very rarely elevated filling pressures. As I mentioned, the left ventricle is mostly protected by the mitral stenosis. And we have to keep in mind that certain measurements are simply not possible. For example, E2E prime is not possible due to the severe calcifications we see over here. So that won't be a valuable measurement and doesn't denote if filling pressures are likely elevated or not. So in mitral stenosis, it's very hard to elevate filling pressures, but mostly if MS is relevant, filling pressures are most likely not elevated, especially they're not elevated by mitral stenosis. There could be another disease entity, which causes, of course, elevated filling pressures, but mitral stenosis protects the left ventricle. I want to review again the diastolic dysfunction from the guidelines. Of course, more information is mentioned. Just check it out in the full video of diastolic dysfunction. In patients with normal left ventricular ejection fraction, we can differentiate if we have normal diastolic dysfunction or if we simply do not know. Or we have diastolic dysfunction, we have to measure the E to E prime, the septal E prime, the lateral E prime. We can measure the TR velocity and the left atrial volume index. In patients with reduced ejection fraction or diseased left ventricle, diseased left hearts, we have three trees we can follow. We can follow the left tree, which shows us normal left atrial pressures, a grade one diastolic dysfunction, which 
already states if patients are symptomatic, so if they have dyspnea, we should consider coronary artery disease or we should even proceed to a diastolic stress test in the middle area, the middle part of the tree we see that, of course, we start always with the E to A ratio. If it has certain numbers, also the E maximum velocity, you can see quite nicely over here, we have to move to the second part of this tree where we can delineate or where we can differentiate if there are most likely normal feeling pressures present or elevated feeling pressures present, or we simply cannot determine left atrial pressures and diastolic dysfunction grading. The E to A ratio above two or two is a grade three diastolic dysfunction restrictive feeling pressure. This means elevated left atrial pressures, elevated feeling pressures. There are certain scores I want to emphasize that you use them. The H2 F PEF score, which includes atrial fibrillation, the body mass index, if the patient needs antihypertensive treatment, if the patient has pulmonary hypertension, elevated feeling pressures, and if the patient is above 60 years old, we can calculate and depending on how many points we actually have, the probability for half PEF is more likely, or if there are zero points, we can most likely exclude half PEF, so heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The second score I personally like to use because it includes a lot of echocardiographic measurements is the HFA PEF score. We have functional, as discussed before here, it is displayed even in more or greater detail what you can actually measure and what the cutoffs are, the septal E prime below seven centimeters per second, the lateral E prime below 10 centimeters per second, or the average E to E prime above or 15, or the TR velocity above 2.8 meters per second with a systolic arterial pulmonary pressure above 35 millimeters of mercury. The morphological criteria, the left atrial volumetric index above 34 milliliters per square meter, or also the RVT and the left ventricular mass index are included in this as well. The biomarkers are included for sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation as well. You can see the major criteria and the minor criteria and you calculate points and if you have five or more points, you have the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in a symptomatic patient. So of course, we need a symptomatic patient. If we have two to four points, diastolic stress test or invasive hemodynamic measurement is recommended. So these are several steps and depending on the steps and what the overall outcome is of the points, we can state that the patient most likely has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or if we need to do further testing, which was also mentioned in the guidelines. So diastolic dysfunction, HEFPEF, we heard it already, there are plenty of risk factors, we discussed them. And heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is definitely not a benign disease. It leads to hospitalizations, the mortality, the one-year mortality and the five-year mortality of 29 or respectively 65% is fairly high. The diuretic therapy is only for the symptom control and the prognosis is, as we can see, bad. But we have treatment. We have SGL2 inhibitors. They act in the proximal tubulus of the kidney. They are a sodium glucose co-transporter and they are the blocking of the SGLT2 inhibitors induced glucosuria, so tinkling sugar. And what do they do? They reduce blood glucose. They also have a lowering effect on the blood pressure. They work independent of insulin and you rarely have hypoglycemias because still you have SGLT1, which also resorbs glucose. And what is most important for us is that they are nephroprotective and also cardioprotective. And they are the first treatment for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where we know we actually can help our patients. They can be used for heart failure with multi reduced ejection fraction as well. We have here the ARNI, the SGLT2 inhibitor, the MRA, and the beta blocker. And for the half PEF, we can use the SGLT2 inhibitor. The AHA, the American Heart Association, stated that the SGLT2 inhibitors are a treatment.
treatment, uh, useful treatment for patients with HEFPEF. It's a 2A recommendation. The ARNI or angiotensin receptor blocker, they show an effect with low normal ejection fraction, a patient with a HEFPEF with low normal ejection fraction, same as MRA. So they are 2B indication. Loop diuretics, they are a class one indication for symptomatic patients. It doesn't matter if it's HEFPEF, HEFMREF, or HEFREF. And SGT2 inhibitors, of course, sugar, yes or no. So diabetes, yes or no. For the heart, it actually does not matter. We can use it for all disease entities of heart failure, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, much reduced ejection fraction, and even for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So keep in mind, tinkling sugar can be cool. This already summarizes this lecture about the phenotypes and I also got in depth of the treatment and some more findings also of LVH. But overall, we have to have a knowledge of the clinical findings and the consequences the echocardiographic findings might have and we have to measure accurately. We should use the clinical findings in combination with echocardiography to bring patients to a proper treatment. We should think about specific etiologies, especially amyloid heart disease. It's not that rare. We know that now because we know the, also the features in echocardiography better and better. So it's definitely a diagnosis to think about, especially in the beginning stages. It's very hard, but with strain imaging, there's an additional tool which can help to identify also not so clear cases and bring to further testing. Echocardiography is a first-line tool, of course, for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, also for LVH and all problems of the heart, basically. And initiate, and that's very, very important, initiate the adequate therapy because of your findings and the consequence you have when you, for example, calculate specific scores and reach the conclusion as a patient actually has half a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction.